This episode of The Candid Frame is supported by Fujifilm's new integration with Frame.io, Camera to Cloud. A new integration between Fujifilm and Frame.io allows transferring images or video to the web directly from your Fujifilm camera using C2C technology. Find out more by visiting fujifilm-x.com and clicking Camera to Cloud. A common query for those teaching photography is about the right and wrong way to do something. You hear questions like, what's the right camera? What's the right lens? Color or black and white? The questions assume that there is one clear definitive answer. But for me, the answers are always preceded by the phrase, it depends. It depends on what you hope to say and communicate with your photographs. It's about knowing what's important to you. When you have a sense of how you are doing a thing, the answer to these many questions come from inside of you rather than from some outside authority. When I look at Richard Sandler's photography, even his earlier work, he seems to understand this. Yes, he learned from and was inspired by photographers like Gary Winogrand, but he didn't merely mimic other photographers. He made his photographs his own, often making the edges of the composition as important as what existed in the center of the frame. His commitment to his vision in still photography and documentary filmmaking results in work that is never cookie cutter and demonstrates the beauty and importance of a personal voice. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. But Richard, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to, to finally have you and, and have some time to catch up. I'm very glad to be on your podcast here. We haven't seen each other since Miami Street Photography Festival. Yeah, yeah. That was a wonderful time down there. Um, I enjoyed it. Yeah, very cool. It's good timing that I have you on the show this week because I saw the uh, Keith Herring photo exhibit last weekend. And there was I had so many ideas, you know, spinning in my mind. And you're, I think you'd be a good person to talk about this particular thing that I was focused on. There was some video of him painting. And I was really struck by how, especially with some of these really complex canvases, it seemed that the paint was just flowing out of them. That there wasn't any sort of like planning or thought of, oh, I'm going to do this here, do a sketch. He would just take the brush and he would dip it into the paint and then he would just start moving across the, the canvas and sort of, sort of making it happen. And it was, it was, it was amazing to see it because I was looking at these canvases going, okay, where, where did he start? <laughs> right. Thinking about it, you know, in the ways I sometimes have seen painters paint where they'll kind of sketch and it was kind of flowing in. But I was thinking that in terms of, you know, photography, that my best moments have been when it is just sort of flowing. It, it doesn't get interrupted by thought or planning or thinking about the next step. It's just about reacting, being present and reacting. And I know that a lot of your work comes out of that sort of, that comes out of that exact sort of mindset. So I, I thought it would be a good place to start to, to, to hear about how, how you found that kind of space for yourself um, when it came to your photography? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I, By the way, I saw Harry, you know, often, you know, living in New York in uh, the 80s. I'd see him in the subway uh, drawing, uh, not, not, not painting, but drawing, you know, mm -hmm. on the black uh, paper surfaces of the of the ad areas, you know, where the where ads would go up, big advertisements would go up. Um, and yeah, I, I saw that in him too. 
Um, my thing uh, with photography was, I, I, before I became a photographer in the years, just prior to becoming a photographer, which really has a beginning, and it's like February 1977, um, I noticed that my peripheral vision was really good um, in walks in the woods or on the street or whatever that I seemed I, I took notice of that for the first time I, it, it crossed my mind wait a minute my peripheral vision is actually pretty good it's amazing I'm you know I, I can see as much as I can and very shortly after that is when photography started and so that idea of being able to see peripherally hooked up with the fact that I was using a Leica, which you, you look through a viewfinder that has frame lines in it, but there's five or 7% outside of the frame lines so mm -hmm. that you're actually seeing what's about to come into the frame on the left and the right and the top and the bottom, if it's coming in from the top and the bottom, usually, you know, it's people walking left or right. But just that peripheral vision on the left and the right, the Leica was this perfect tool for somebody that had good peripheral vision. Yeah. And I, I found, wow, oh yeah, okay, so that started when I realized I had good peripheral vision. And um, so I could see things coming in. And so I trained myself in the Leica viewfinder to put that to my advantage. And in order to do that, clearly, I had to be very fast, very fast. And I grew up playing sports. You know, I was a really good athlete, tennis player, softball, uh, other, other sports, uh, bowling, I don't know. But, um, but anyway, uh, the skills of, of, of sports also came into it. And that was a big part of the way I approached street photography. Everybody does it a little bit differently. But I could see a scene and move, you know, like really quickly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had long since lost any inhibitions. Pretty much I was able to, you know, shoot in a very uninhibited way. You know, I was looking for these complicated pictures. They didn't always have to be complicated, but I addressed myself always to making complicated pictures that you make order out of that complexity. That's the one that always was my mm, kind of Zen koan, you know, that was the hand of, that was the sound of one hand clapping, if you will, yeah. making these complicated pictures where everything's in the right place. You don't make many of them in your life, especially if you have, you know, if there's eight or 10 or 12 people in the frame, it becomes almost impossible. But I approached it from, I, 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 I I gave myself etudes, etudes in the sense mm -hmm. that, okay, today I'm going to shoot, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make super conscious of the four edges of the frame and I'm going to try to put the most interesting information on the edges, or I'm going to shoot from just no more than three feet away, or I'm going to use the flash or not use the flash. That was another big thing that I, because my mentors taught me when I when I came up in Boston, um, the people who mentored me in photography taught me how to use the flash from day one on a 35 millimeter camera. So I was literally in the first days of shooting, I was shooting on the street with a flash, and I had no I had no idea, you know, about photographers or street photographers or anything like that. I just. I just knew that was what I always wanted to do was to shoot on the street. So yeah, athletics made me being fast. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also eating natural food diet. I'm like not drinking. I'm not smoking pot at that time or, or if I am just once in a while, but not, you know, if anything, it's helping me, it's not hindering me, but no drinking and, um, you know, leading a really clean life. Um, you know, I've been eating macrobiotically for, you know, over 50 years. So, you know, I, I had good reflexes, you know, and I kept them going. 
Um, so a lot of it is about just being really fast and, and really um, not arrogantly confident, but confident. You know, like, I got to do this. I knew I had to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Highly motivated. So, so the desire to make the kinds of photographs that you just described uh, became more important than any sort of sense of awkwardness or self-conscious that you, you might have had. Well, yeah, and also there was a, you know, a social component to it. You know, I'm walking around with the fact that I'm living, you know, in a society that is, uh, you know, egregiously uh, unaware of itself and uh, is, uh, you know, uh, based, uh, formed, uh, uh, founded on such terrible human behavior so, you know, when I see four women in fur coats, you know, I'm going to get them all in my frame because I want you to, like, really see how disgusting this is that these poor animals are raised, you know, to be worn on people's backs in this, this uh, you know, show of, uh, of, of, of wealth and, 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 you know, conquistador mentality, shall we yeah. say. Yeah, and that's one of the strengths of your photographs, along with you being a real master in terms of how you work the edges of the frame. I really admire that in, in so much of your work. It's just phenomenal. But the idea is that your your point of view really comes across in your photographs. Yeah, I, 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 I always knew that. You know, I grew up, I wasn't exactly a red diaper baby, but I grew up in a very lefty house. And my mother was an actress and Shakespearean actress. She went to NYU drama school. You know, she was a bohemian. She smoked pot, you know, in the 30s and stuff. And, you know, my, my, I had a cool mother. And, you know, she she was very, uh, very helpful to me. And, I, and uh, uh, in, in, you know, I, I, I learned so much from her. And also my godfather was, uh, was like this... Um, media uh, sort of genius he was uh, his name was Alan Duchovny and he um, was a press agent at um, DC Comics when they got this property called Superman and he was uh, working in, he was working in the mailroom and he was a press agent anyway so they you know was, didn't think much of it but it was 1938 so uh, the comic book was out uh, in I think it was 39 and uh, I think it was in the fall of 39 I'm not exactly sure but anyway three or four months later they said to him here kid see what you can do with this Superman thing because it's going on radio and so he was the first writer director producer of Superman on radio oh wow um, in, uh, in and that and the first radio shows premiered in I believe it was February of 1939 and he's like 27, 28 years old. Uh, and here he is writing, you know, scripts. The show was like 15 minutes long. And But anyway, what his genius was, was to sculpt the, scoop, the Superman character into being the opposite of the Nazi Ubermensch. Mm -hmm. So the American Superman was in favor of human rights, in favor of, you know, uh, human rights for all peoples, you know, women's rights, uh, um, civil rights of all kinds. He was on the side of the little guy. You know, truth, justice, and the American way meant, you know, immigration and social net, you know, social, uh, 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 you know, safety net. And, um, you know, a country that worked for everybody and being able to, you know, send your kids to college if you're working for GM, you yeah. know, and be able to buy a house. You know, this was the American, you know, the, at its best, the American dream. So anyway, he was my godfather and, uh, uh, you know, he had a huge in, impact upon me. You know, his, his, his work, uh, you know, the Superman character, you know, permeated my, my life. To a certain extent, and then he got into TV and did uh, uh, TV shows, and his influence was even greater. I'm now like six or seven years old, um, 
And uh, then he became the director of children's programming for CBS as the last job of his life. Cartoons, a lot of, you know, it was, it was probably a lot of junk, but there was, there was still, you know, you know, he, he won two Emmys for a, 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 um, a show that he created called 30 Minutes, uh, which was 60 minutes for kids, kids reporting on the news. Yeah. And that was, that be, you know, that was a really big thing. And it, and it was, a, you know, a very, very popular show. So he won the Emmy two years in a row. In fact, it's in my, one of his Emmys is in my, is in my uh, living room. Oh, that's awesome. I, I, I still have it. So between my mother and, and my godfather and, you know, my, you know, those exposures and, you know, wanting, you know, and being a Jew and growing up in a tradition of, you know, social, um, you know, so, so, social uh, orient, being oriented towards equality in all ways, you know, you know, the better parts of monotheism that regardless of which stripe we're into, the better parts of it, you know. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, so that was it. And, and I had fast reflexes, so that's all I can say. You know, I can, I can really, you know, I can, I can move quickly, you know. Unlike Gary Winogrand, who was, he could move quick too, but he would kind of stay in one place and let the world come to him. He would like yeah. stand in the middle of a block. He'd, he'd stand in the, kind of in the middle of the block of a lot of people walking towards him. So they'd have to go to him, you know, go left or right. And, you know, he would, you know, kind of do this, these crazy things to keep, not, not to attract attention, but, um, you know, he was, uh, let the world come to him very often, I noticed, because I'd see him on the street. And, and you studied workshop. him. We studied yeah, with him for a little while. Yeah, I took a, yeah. a four-day workshop with when he went in Boston. That's how I started, you know, photography. I just watched him, man. I watched him really carefully. And he was, you know, he was... He was really beautiful to watch. He didn't move fast, but he moved beautifully. You know, it's like he was, you know, like Bernard King on the Knicks from years ago. You know, he had mm. he had these kind of like quick moves, you know, that were just smooth, you know, <laughs> just he saw his opening and would take it, you know. Yeah, it's, it would be it's an interesting comparison because there isn't much footage of him photographing. But if you could, if you compare him to uh, Brasson, they both were like dancers on the street. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Each in their own sort of unique way. But you can see their physic their physicality is part of their photographic practice. My my technique was was much more herky jerky than either of those two guys, but the other thing that I was doing, I, I don't know if they were, but but in the working of the edges, you are making a photograph that is, you're trying to make photographs that are either going to work or fail, mm -hmm. and so you're you know particularly if you if the edges become so important and more than one edge becomes important. That's when it really gets interesting, when there's multiple places where the information in the picture is on the edge. Um, so, you know, it could, it could be like that, you know, it yeah. could be like, you know, it could be like jerky, like I see it, you know. But, you know, I like I say, I was I was not shy, you know, I, for some reason I was I was not shy, I guess, because I grew up kind of a cocky kid. You know, on, on the streets, not of Manhattan, but of Queens. But still, it was, uh, you know, it had its own, its own rough and tumble, you know, ways back then in the, in the fifties. You know. Yeah, because you, you can't make images like that and be passive, because the, the the thing about working the edges is that the moment hasn't revealed itself yet. You have to sort of anticipate it, because you may have the center area of the frame sort of figured out. Because those things are sort of fixed. But the things in the periphery, the, those are things that are about to enter the frame. They haven't entered the frame yet, but you're kind of like going, in a couple of seconds, it's going to happen, and then I'm going to have to move and make the, and make the shot. And sometimes, especially if you're working with a 35 or, or a 28, 28. you gotta, you gotta be in there in order to make it work. You can't be yeah. shy. Yeah, you have to be close with the 28 for sure for anything to, have any uh, impact but um, yeah that's exactly the way I work and when I teach that which I did recently um, 
in a class at the Bronx Documentary Center. I taught a two-day thing. But I said, you know, when you're framing uh, and there's something, you know, in the middle or in the center middle area of the frame, at that last split second, don't look at it. Put your eye on the mm -hmm. edge. Go to an edge. Forget about that. It's in the frame. You've seen it. You don't have to dwell on it. Go somewhere else. And, you know, that's, that's the real trick. It's yeah. like, don't keep looking in the center. If something's there, you don't, you know, big, let it go. There's plenty of surprises in every frame. You know, you're, th th this perfection that you're aspiring to is only going to happen yeah. once in a while. But you want to maximize that perfection by taking chances and letting letting failure happen. I was about to say that. Yeah, exactly. At least, at least fail trying to make an interesting frame that has really interesting stuff on the edges, but also, you know, size, you know, the, 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 you know, the little and the small, you know, the thing that's near the frame and the thing that's, you know, further away from the frame, but is perfectly placed. So that was another etude I would give myself. Yeah. How do I make a frame where the smallest thing in the frame is the most important thing, right? Mm -hmm. There's a way to do that, you know, silhouetting, for instance, you know, does that inherently, right? If there's a silhouette, if there's anything silhouetted in a frame, your eye will go to, to that, particularly if there's nothing else silhouetted. In other words, like, how do you, how do you take advantage of the frame, you know? How do you, how do you work it over, kind of, you know? Lee Freelander, if you look at his work, it's like astounding. It's like the guy oh. must have a yeah. fly's compound eye to see so much, you know, in such an incredibly compacted way. Yeah, I've studied the shit out of Freelander, you know, but also Arbus and Winogrand, you know, I, I, that, that, was, that was my gate, you know. Yeah. All three of them were doing something utterly different and, and so brilliantly. And it's not surprising that John Sharkovsky and company made their careers on that show, you know, that they, mm -hmm. they put together, he put together new documents. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm definitely one of Winogrand's children. There's no, I mean, all three of them, but particularly Winogrand. And, you know, un, un, unabashedly, you know, he's, he's my, my man, you know, and, I know that you were um, uh, dri uh, driving a cab for a while, and that you yeah. were shooting from 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 the cab. Yeah. T tell me about that experience. I know it was kind of early in your, in your development, but uh, what influence did that have? Uh, you know, just had to make a living, and was a photographer, and uh, you know, I needed to get around, and cab gets you around. You know, you're just like. You're here, you go there, you never dreamed of being there, and now you're there, and you got a camera. So I could make pictures either from the cab or I'd stop and get out of the cab and make pictures, mm -hmm. you know, in places that I never would have gotten to. So it was a way to get my camera. And then when I moved to New York City in 1980, uh, I got a job as a foot messenger uh, carrying packages oh. you know, from, from place to place in Manhattan with a beeper, you know, and I'd have to call up the mothership and they'd tell me, go to 420 Park and pick up a, a, a package and bring it down to 10 Wall Street, you know, so I have to get on, I'd walk a way that I never maybe walked before or I'd, you know, get on the subway. I have to get on the subway, of course. So that's where the subway pictures come from, the early mm, ones. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm on the subway all the time delivering packages. So I wanted to get a job where I could um, uh, where I could still shoot. Um, when I moved to New York, I moved there on the strength of an offer from the great, great photo editor of the New York Times at that time named Paul Hossifros. Um And he, I showed him my portfolio and I was still in Boston. And he said, if you move to New York, I'll give you, I'll give you work. So that's why me and my wife moved to New York when we did in 1980. But it wasn't enough money, to, you know, to to pay all the bills, so I had to yeah. take this, messen this foot messenger job, uh, and that su supplemented the income, and I was able to stay on the street and keep shooting. So that's when you transitioned. You were in, when you were in Boston, you were still an ac acupuncturist. Yeah, you I, I, you've done your homework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I went to acupuncture school in England in 1971, you know, and uh, uh, I studied, you know, I studied and I got my degree, you know, I, 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 I uh, began uh, my acupuncture practice about two and a half years later, came back to the United States, of course, I was, I, I would go back and forth from England in those three years and uh yeah, practiced acupuncture as my way of making a living, and, and it was an incredibly gratifying experience to learn this, you know, medical art form that you know really, really can help people. You know, it's 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 just extraordinary. It was so so rewarding, um, and I was practicing acupuncture until '79 when I moved into uh, a house in Cambridge. Uh, where I got the, got bit by the photography bug and uh, it became so strong that I had to stop practicing acupuncture. I was doing okay. both for a while. I was practicing acupuncture and shooting on the street. But I was living in a house where I only had to pay $30 a month rent, you know, in, in a house that was owned by one of the great psychologists, uh, Harvard professor David McClelland. He's the guy who hired and subsequently had to fire Timothy Leary. He hired Leary for oh, his job okay. at Harvard and Richard Alpert, a.k.a. Bob Ramdas, um, for their jobs. So I was living in his and his wife's house, and they were Quakers, and they were a beautiful, beautiful couple. They spoke the thee and the thy, you know, and what does he want for dinner? You know, what does the God and you want for dinner? You know, it was... It was heaven. It was the parents that none of us had. There was like seven or eight of us living in the house. And Mary McClellan, the, uh, the wife of David, was a painter, and she taught at the Friends School. She taught art at the Friends School, and she had a, a, be- a dark room in the basement. And she had a Leica, which she didn't want. And I had a, 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 a housemate right across the hall from me in a very, you know, very big, large house with about eight or nine bedrooms. And um, he knew he was a he was a commercial photographer, and he taught me the ropes. See, so I was lucky. I was I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I just walked into all these things, you know. But that, 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 all of those elements, you know, here you are. You've already spent, you know, about eight years as an acupuncturist. You know, you're doing well enough. You've got cheap rent, an interesting place with interesting people. You know, you're. You're starting a family or about to, and you have every reason to stay in Boston and just keep doing what you're doing, right? So, so what made you flip the switch as opposed to just staying where you were and just like sticking with the familiar? Because a lot of people can't make that leap. What what allowed you to? Uh, Well, I guess what it was was uh, because of my connection to David and. Harvard uh, through him to, uh, you know, in a, not a very direct way, but enough that one of uh, David's um, students was also taking a class in photography at Harvard that semester, uh, 77, with Ben Lifson. Ben Lifson at the time was the photo critic for the Village Voice. Very, very, very articulate Writer, he wrote the introduction, by the way, to Matt Weber's book. You know, of the mm. Urban Prisoner. Yeah, Ben wrote that introduction. Anyway, so I asked if I could sit in on. I asked the friend uh, of Dave, uh, the student of David's, if he could ask Ben Lifson if I could sit in on the class. Um, and and, he, and amazingly, he said yes. And so I sat in on Lifson's class, and that's the first time I ever heard of. Robert Frank or Henri Cartier-Bresson or wherever, Harbis, Versailles, you know. Um, and that's where it started. And at the end of that class, he said, oh, by the way, and this is like June or, or May of 77, he says, oh, by the way, Gary Winogrand's coming to Boston uh, in July to teach a four-day workshop. Some of you, if you want, you should take it. And that was me. I did, I did take it. So... Um, but, uh, you know, it's just been, you know, one good fortune after another. I, you know, I, I must have good karma or something. I, I just, you know, I fell into all of these things. And, you know, I just, 
you know, once I got bit by photography, I mean, I loved being an acupuncturist. I, you know, it was, it was like I really found my thing, you know. It's wonderful to see people get better and, and amazing things happen. And it, it never harmed. It only helped or did nothing. It never harmed. And it was just like, you know, right livelihood. You know, it's what... Mm -hmm like what the Buddha called right livelihood. You know, I'm making my living doing something that's good. But then when I got bit by the photography bug, you know, it was like, wait a minute. I, I mean, <laughs> prior to that, I was, you know, I was cooking in macrobiotic restaurants in Boston. In the back, that's when I moved to Boston to study macrobiotics with Michio Kushi, who was, you know, the... Uh, incredible teacher of uh, of these, you know, Asian uh, discipline, uh, medical disciplines in in terms of uh, Japanese folk medicine, and and uh, and that's where I heard about acupuncture from him. But anyway, after cooking in macrobiotic restaurants for a number of years and starting, you know, being part of starting one in Boston and then starting one on my own with, uh, I mean, pretty much spearheading the, in Boston. And then another one in New York in 69 called The Cauldron. Um, you know, I had pretty well cemented my ability to be disciplined and one-pointed and, you know, study. Yeah. Stu study, like really apply yourself, read, ask questions. You want to learn something, just find out, you know, just so... Yeah. Yeah. Both the macrobiotic, you know, the cooking and, and the diet and the acupuncture are all about sort of the body. So you're very aware about how your body feels, how it moves. Did that did that extend to how you observed people moving around you? And did that inform the photography in any way? Um, yeah, because there are means of uh, diagnosis in in Chinese medicine. Japanese medicine, it comes from China, but there, there are means of diagnosis in Chinese medicine that definitely uh, uh, pertain to the body, your body language, um, the tone of your voice, uh, you know, the, 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 the colors that you can see um, on people's faces. Um, these are all you know, kinds of things I was very aware of, um, and uh, I don't, I, I can't make a big deal about it. But you know, it all, it all. I mean, I had compassion for people. Let's put it that way. That's mm. probably the main thing. You know, was that my greatest joy was that people would get better. My greatest, you know, uh, that's all I thought about was them. You know, so. You know, it, it opened the door to dealing with people in difficult circumstances and to in, 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 in and it translated from acupuncture to photography in, you know, trying to make photographs that bring to light, you know, the inequalities that are embedded in this way of life that's so terribly unfair to so many parts of it. So, you know, it all kind of was a grand, you know, synthesis, really, of things. I don't know if we saw a pie graph of it. You know, I don't know how I would put it together. But, um, you know, I just had, now that I look back on it, I guess I had all of the right ingredients to be a photographer. Um, and, and everything seems to have led up to that point. Although now that I am more of a filmmaker than a photographer, I would say that about filmmaking because I... I love that even as much or more, you know, now. So that is, uh, you know, it's been a journey, you know, and I, I've, I've tried to fill it with as much um, interest as possible and not let the demons, you know, stop me. You know, you? I'm growing up a man in a male-dominated culture. It's not that hard. You know? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, you're you're a golden boy. You can do anything you want. Yeah, Dickie, you can be anything you want. You know, so I took my parents at their word. You know, mm -hmm. but I guess they were seeing in me things that I didn't see as a child. You know.
One of the reasons I created The Candid Frame was that I wanted to listen to a show that focused on conversations about being a photographer and living a creative life. In 2006, there were a handful of photography podcasts, most of which focused on technique and gear. I wanted something different. So instead of waiting for someone to create it, I did it myself. 16 years and 600 episodes later, there are now hundreds of podcasts and YouTube channels focused on photography, but I believe that what we do here is still special and unique. By being a listener and supporter of the show, you have provided me the opportunity to improve my interview skills and learn the ins and outs of podcasting. Many other content producers have had to change their vision to focus on tech and gear reviews to build their audience, and I'm glad we haven't made that choice. That would have garnered me more listeners and sponsors, but I didn't want to dedicate myself to that. That decision has been affirmed by the fact that we're still here and have remained true to that vision. Now, your financial support helps to keep the show focused on just that. So, if you benefit from TCF and want to show your appreciation and support, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter today. You can do this by contributing $5, 10 $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. By doing so, you help us to produce a show dedicated to great and insightful conversations about what it means to be a photographer and to lead a creative life. Again, it's patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Thanks. You were working as a photojournalist and having the camera and having the press pass gives you sort of entree into, you know, a whole different world than the person who works like sort of a nine to five. And as we've already talked about, you know, you are already sort of aware of, you know, the disparities, the economic disparities, the racial disparities that sort of existed. How did, did the work as a photojournalist sort of accentuate and inform that, that consciousness that you already sort of had, had uh, that was already gestating in you? Well, um, I played it uh, a little safe with the photojournalism because I was also raising my kid uh, by myself in this period, single parenting my son, who's now 52. Um, and this, you know, he was born in 1970 and, you know, we're living, you know, together uh, in New York, you know, in like 82, 83, uh, 81 also. And um, so I had to bring the bacon home. I had a chirping bird in the nest that needed worms. So I would take whatever gigs I got. So I, I didn't, you know, like my friends uh, at the time, you know, Eugene Richards, Alex Webb, Jeff Jacobson, uh, Nubar Alexanian. Um, uh, they were going for the photojournalism jobs and mm -hmm. maybe some of them had kids. I don't know. But I was, a sing I was the only one who was a single parent. So it was a doubly difficult kind of thing. So, you know, I did work, uh, well, I got some great gigs, you know, uh, in Boston and then after Boston working for the Boston Phoenix, uh, very, you know, good, like the, 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 the village voice of Boston, very good paper, weekly paper. And, uh, so I, in Boston, I really, I, I think I got my best jobs. I mean, they sent me to three mile Island, you know, after it happened. And then they sent me to, uh, to, uh, 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 three mile. Uh, I'm sorry. To um, uh, the Democratic uh, convention in both New York and San Francisco in '84. Um, New York in '80, San Francisco in '84. But I didn't. I didn't. Uh, you know, try to get the long range kind of gigs that like Alex and Gene and, and would get. You know, where they would work on a, a photojournalistic project, you know, in the spirit of Eugene Smith, for instance, mm -hmm. for a long period of time. I couldn't really do that because I, you know, I, I was raising a kid alone. So, I mean, I could go away. My parents did live in Queens. So if I had a job that required my being away, I could do it. But I, you know, I, I really, you know, I, I was, 
I was there for my son the whole time, you know, as much as possible. Um, and, and also I found out that, you know, photojournalism was really interesting, but what I was really good at was shooting on the street. So uh, putting a picture story together for me was, it was almost too much pressure because my gig with shooting is shooting, you know, shoot, shoot first, ask questions later, you know, like yeah. you have an intuition, shoot, shoot, shoot. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And the more you do it, you know, with intention, the better you get at it. Because if you do it with intention, you can get away with so much in shooting. You know, if you like yeah. go up with somebody and go pow, you know, um, but not 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 in an aggressive way. There's a way still to do it where it's, you know, uh, not not aggressive. You know? well, what did you to pick up uh, the video camera? Well, in 92, I got the New York Foundation for the Arts grant in photography, which was, you know, really all the recognition I had ever hoped to get. You know, I was really glad that I got that and got a $7,000 check. I uh, felt by 92, on all honesty, as I looked at my work, that I had made my best work. And I could continue shooting with the possibility of repeating myself, or I could switch gears completely. And um, I switched gears completely. My friend Steve Hirsch, great, great street photographer, New York street photographer, um, he got into video. And so he taught me how to use the, uh, uh, the first palm quarters where you could, you know, a good Sennheiser mic. This would, this would be uh, 1992. Um, um, uh, a palm quarter shooting high eight, which is cut down beta, beta SP tape, high eight tape, analog tape, not digital tape. Um, and, and then with a nice Sennheiser mini shotgun mic on the on the shoe and boom I had this great sound and I had this you know camera that I could walk around the street and talk to people and it opened up just a whole world you know of, of to me and also a part of my personality that I would use as a photographer you know to keep things rolling and not yeah. get bites and be personable and don't you know and but get what I needed to get with intention. Um, but it opened up a whole new world and the exact opposite of still photography. So I started in 92 and I was like, I was as hooked on video as I was on stills when I started. And pretty much in 92, the camera went on the back burner, uh, the still camera. I, I kept, I kept it with me for three or four years and I would photograph a little bit. It was hard to serve two masters. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was hard to be, you know, and plus the photo gods are jealous and they got mad at me <laughs> for getting into video. And they said, bastard, we're not throwing you any more bones. <laughs> yeah, you thought you were in charge? Uh -uh. Photo gods are in charge. You know, get back to your filmmaking and, you know, shut the fuck up. So, and that happened. I had a hard time making pictures after 92, but I transitioned to video making, which brought me as much joy as still photography ever did. And I thought I was as good at or better, really. I, it came so easily to me. My mother what, was an actress so, also, by the way. So no, what, what was what was new about it? What were you discovering that you could sound? sound and yeah. staying put. Like if I'm, you, you saw God's yeah, Times Square, right? Yeah, uh -huh. So you got to stay put. It's not like boom, goodbye. You know, it's the exact opposite of that. If motion... Motion is the exact opposite of stillness, right? So you got to stay there and talk to you want to stay. You want to stay there and talk to people and to use your still photography ability to make beautiful frames. You know, I was so fortunate yet again. You know, I had I, I was like I had Times Square to myself at this incredible time, you yeah. know, when. When, when New York was changing so radically and Giuliani, you know, Dink, I mean, it actually started under Dinkins, but, but then, uh, cause Dink, and then Dinkins beat, you know, Giuliani the first time, but Giuliani beat him the second time. And when Giuliani happened, you know, then it really, 
the, the wheels of the gentrification and the change of the old Times Square uh, were really in motion and the use of eminent domain to, you know, seize properties and so forth and get porno completely out of Times Square. So I caught the end of that world, you know, and, and the beginning of, you know, what I call um, Neo York. Yeah. Yeah, it, we were just talking about how you work the edges of the frame in, in stills, but your video is all about the periphery. Yeah. In, t in terms of just the subject matter. I mean, those are the people that are not usually in the center of the camera or the neighborhoods that are in the center of the camera. It's the stuff yeah, at the I, edges that people are, it's kind of sort of blurry and that people are ignoring. And that's one of the things I really loved about, um, about your films. Well, you know, I, I wanted to, I, the thing was, I didn't want to keep repeating. I didn't want I mean, I, I made, you know, I made the pictures that I, I, I was happier. I was happy for, very happy for what I had done. And I felt that, you know, I could use the structural elements that I learned, discipline elements that I learned from being a, you know, a chef and being an acupuncturist and being a still photographer that I could now apply that anywhere I wanted to go. I mm -hmm. learned how to learn, you know. I learned how to learn and I, and I, you know, I just, you know, I'd find people to teach me what I wanted to learn. And generally, if you go to somebody who knows something that you want to learn and you say, I want to learn it, they're almost always very happy to help you. So Steve Hirsch, great photographer. Now he's a painter, terrific, terrific street photographer. Um, uh, and uh, like Gildan, but better. Uh, more, more similar to Bruce than to me, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, the pictures are, are 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 trippier. They're much much trippier. Uh, I, I'm not taking anything away from Bruce, but you know the three of us work very much you know together a lot on the street too. You know in that period of time, and uh, so you know, and, and I also I know Bruce from before uh, from before either of us were photographers because we used to shoot pool in the same pool room. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Whereabouts was that? Rio Park, uh, the Q club. It was called the Q club. And, um, who was the better player? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> we, you know, it was also a hangout, but it was very serious for me. I grew up that, that, in, in a way that's where the gods of Times Square came from because I grew up, you know, in the, in the in in the midnight cowboy era mm -hmm. of Times Square, because I was way into learning to becoming a hustler as a kid, you know, a, not not a in the hustler that uh, yeah I got it John Voight was, um, which I never realized how homoerotic it actually all was when I first saw the movie, but now that Nancy Bursky's made a film about it, um, it just came out by the way and got great reviews. About, about Midnight Cowboy, the, you know, and John Schlesinger. Um, but um, I'm anxious to see that. But that that's when I was in Times Square as a kid, uh, starting in, um, well, even earlier. I, I started going to Times Square around, um, like, 1957 by myself. I'd take the train in from Queens and hang out in Times Square and go to the Penny Arcades and go to the side shows, called, called, one, one called Hubert's, which is where Dion Arvis also began shooting. She became, I didn't know her then, of course, but she was working that place when I was going there as a kid. I mean, as a uh -huh. photographer, she was photographing the freaks and the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the weirdness that was, um, that was Hubert's on 42nd Street. But there was also Ripley's Believe It or Not, and then there were all the penny arcades, like I said, and movie theaters all over the place, playing B movies. And so I, I grew up in Times Square, you know, in the pool rooms and the sideshows. And, uh, you know, I, I, it was it was, you know, quite amazing. So I felt at home in Times Square, too, you know, so all these elements of my life, you know, just sort of like were you know, conspiring at every turn to make this kind of synthesis of, of, of experiences into something, you yeah. know, and, um, I'm very, you know, lucky.
Your your film is very interesting because it's it's there's um there's a feeling of spontaneity that pervades the entire thing. It's a documentary, but it doesn't have kind of the the structure that I think most people would expect to have it a documentary. And I yeah. think that largely it comes from the fact that it's like you're not sort of you've taught yourself basically how to how to do this thing, and that you've been very true to your own voice rather than having to sort of adapt it in order to fit some some genre. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it was an outsider. It was an outsider view. Uh, I, I, I took the view of the outsider. Um, and, you know, like putting the, he, the Hebrew Israelites who were, you know, so important to be in this thing. Um, you, know, you so-called white man, you had over 400 years to share this kingdom but you wasn't meant to do that. You was set up to be the devil on earth. I take my hat off to you. You've done a good job. You've done a good, excellent job of being deceiving and deceptive. Love is going to be brought here by Christ when he destroys you and puts you in slavery. That's the <laughs> love that Christ was talking about. So, and, you know. Oh, you got that memorized down. Well, you know, when you're, when you're in the editing room and you hear, you know, when you make a, move, a flick and you're in the editing room, <laughs> you know, it, it gets into your head. But I also agreed with them. I agreed. I mean, I, they were extremely misogynistic and, and terribly hateful to, uh, you know, other black people, uh, you know, and, and white people. I mean, nobody escaped their wrath if... But but I understand where they came from. This was that they, you know, I would say to people, if you don't like what these people are saying, well, this is the monster that racism created. These children are not born that way. You know, this is this is what race this is what racism created. So, you know, learn your history, walk the walk backwards in time and see what your ancestors did so you could have this life. Yeah. As you said, you had dedicated, you know, a lot of years to making films, but you released your first monograph several years ago, and you currently have an exhibit, as we speak, um, going on. So tell me about what you learned as a result of going through your archive, choosing and editing images and sequencing them. What did you learn about your work that you, you probably hadn't really con even considered or, or were aware of when you were uh, making there's them? There's so many pictures I overlooked. It was crazy. You know, I mean, I made the book, but it's because I had, I got so much rejection, you know, for so long as a, as a art photographer, street mm -hmm. photographer, whatever you want to call it, you know, documentary street. Um, that, uh, you know, I, 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 it forced me to edit my pictures so severely that if there was any question mark, it was out. You know, it's like the only way I'm going to get through to these people is if I show my best, best, best and nothing else. Mm -hmm. OK, so I did that and I got rejected at every turn. So, um, you know, I got. That it depressed me to a certain extent, but it also gave me, you know, the momentum to, to shoot even more. So then I move up here. I'm up. I live upstate. I moved out of uh, Manhattan in 2016 and moved up here to Catskill, New York, seven years ago, almost exactly. And have a dark room here again, of course, and decided that I was just going to go through my work and see what I had missed. I mean, I've been always going through my contact sheets and I'd always been finding things and it seemed like, you know, I would always keep finding stuff. So I decided that I was going to really, you know, meticulously go through everything. And then the pandemic happened, of course, mm -hmm. and that really intensified it. So from 20, 2020 to now, it, it really went into high gear after the pandemic, but I had found a bunch of pictures before the pandemic. Uh, after in 2016, 2017. And it was so enlivening that like now I'm like, you know, back into photography, or, but editing. I still shoot all the time, every day. I walk around my Leica every day. I'm shooting trees. I'm shooting anything 
that I want to shoot still, you know, I don't know that any of them are any good, but I don't care. I just love photography and I love to shoot and frame things. So you can frame trees just like you can frame people. It's just stuff and frames, you know, You're still making frames and you have time to re you have time to move this way and that you have very little time on the street. You got one movement, maybe one move in you, maybe two. And if you don't get it, you don't get it. But with the trees, with trees, there you go. Mm -hmm, look this way. <laughs> what about that? And then there's so many choices, and it's it's too mental. And I say this is crazy. Oh fuck it! And I just do it. Whatever. That, that that's going to be as informed, just like your filmmaking was informed by everything you've done before. This kind of work is going to be informed just the same that. way. Yeah. There's there's lots of stuff in there. You yeah. know, it's a whole different thing. I. I you know, I'm the thing about me that I'm very grateful for is that the taking of the pictures is ahead of the person taking them. In other words, there's a place of me that's aware of what I will be in the future type of thing, you know? Mm. So when I went back to the work, I re and I found all this stuff that I really liked that I think is good, obviously. And I'm saying, who was that guy who rejected that picture? Yeah. yeah. Who was that guy? You know, I'm not that guy anymore. So, you know, I've learned a lot more about myself as a person and about my editing for having gone my work, having gone through my work pretty much in its totality in these last seven years. Yeah, I'm going through my entire digital archive, which goes back to 92 right now, because I'm trying to put together just a little portfolio of the of the work which i haven't done to this point and i find the same thing a lot of surprises in there especially when i um do pairings when i just bring because that's the way i'm starting i'm not I'm, i i i have already have images flagged but right now i'm just like putting images together just to see how they look opposite each other yeah and it's really interesting how I'm surprised with images that I've been familiar with with years, and all of a sudden it's by bringing it together with something else that were taken years apart in different locations, have nothing in common, and then and then all of a sudden they just they become they come alive again. It's yeah, man. I'm, we're on the exact same page. I'm doing the exact same thing, you know, uh, with my films, with my film. Mm. Uh, when when the film is digitized, you know you can go through it frame by frame and make stills of those frames. You know, there's a lot oh, of them on my uh, yeah. Instagram page, and then put them together as diptychs is exactly what or, or even four grids of four I was doing. But diptychs, I really know where you're coming from. I mean, I love it. That's another whole, you know, uh, uh, you know vein or artery you know that leads to the heart you know it's another you know it's the inferior or the superior vena cava you know it's a whole nother highway of 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 visual uh uh storytelling or whatever you know it's it's beautiful because it's it's inventing something brand new yeah you know, it's the two of them together and sometimes they two of them go together in ways where you don't see the, where they're seamless. You know, you, you can, you can, I, I, sometimes I like to put them together where they're touching mm -hmm. and where, you know, where there's, you know, black, where the, the two, there's oh, the, two areas, yeah. mm -hmm. the black of one goes into the black of the other. And maybe you enhance that a little bit in Photoshop to make it even blacker. But these are images, you know, that, that look amazing together, and then they look like like two two uh, two uh, verticals, you know, or a horizontal. You know, I mean, two horizontals are a vertical. So I'll put you know a horizontal on top of a horizontal, a horizontal that's black on the bottom and and black on the top, so that you don't see the seam between them yeah. between them at all, and it looks like one image. I can send you. A couple oh, I'd of love those. to see that. Yeah. But but one of the things I'm I'm sort of understanding about this process is that those kind of surprises and you know the sort of the gifts that you get years after you've made the work what's 
incumbent in sort of setting the, the stage for that is being kind of fearless in making the photographs in the first place and and not being precious about the photographs. You talked about earlier about, you know, composing the images at the edges of the frame, you know, and, and forgetting what's in the middle. And the thought that came into my head is sometimes you have to uh, sacrifice a good photograph and risk failing for the potential of being able to make a great photograph. And if you're unwilling to do that, if you always want to sort of play it safe in order just to get a good photograph, that's all it'll ever be. Just good. Yeah, exactly. And those are the pictures generally where the subject matter is only in the middle. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it tends to be more in the middle and it's safe. I mean, I, I, I like composed things where things are in the middle, but when it comes to street photography, I want it to feel like the street, you know, and I want to, I want it to be succinct. It's quite a journey. Um, yeah. You know, it, it keeps unfolding at every turn. And, um, you know, and filmmaking is, you know, for me, you know, my, my expensive passion now. You know, it's, it's very hard to keep up with the money involved in scanning Super 8, 16 and 35 millimeter motion picture film. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm in over way in, in way over my head. I shoot, but I have a refrigerator filled with shot film, you know, that hasn't been developed. You know, as luckily, I, luckily I got all of the film that I need for my next documentary, this one called AKA Martha's Vineyard. Um, uh, I've got all of that film developed and scanned. A friend of mine was very nice to put up the lot of money that it required to scan. I had like 40,000 feet of Super 8. Oh, oh wow. And uh, 25,000 of 16 and about only 5,000 of 35. But it was shot over many years and all of the color in, it's all reversal film, and all of the color uh, in, in the 16 and the Super 8 is Kodachrome. It was all shot before, uh, you know, the, the, the bell rang on the end of Kodachrome, which was January 1st, 2010. And I got it developed before. So where, where are you in this process? Are you, are you in the process of logging all that stuff? Have you done a, a rough yeah. draft or what, where are you? I don't have a, no, I, I'm, I'm waiting to get to the West Coast to edit that. That's, that's one of the things I want to, you know, do it. My editor lives in, uh, in, uh, uh, what do you call it? In uh, Idlewild. Okay. And so we, we we're going to be editing that together pretty soon since I'm moving to the West. I may just go right down to Idlewild as soon as I, uh, move to Vancouver and, and, you know, even not even look for an apartment and go down and begin the editing with him in Idlewell. But also, and I really would love your help on this, is I want to, um, uh, this is, uh, you know, changing the subject, but, you know, um, I would love you to help me because I'm, uh, I've been compiling, I don't know if I mentioned this to you before, actually, I don't think I did, but I've been compiling, compiling, uh, work and names for a Los Angeles only street photography show that begins in 1954 with the 12 photographs that Robert Frank included uh, in Los uh, in in the Americans that are in uh, in Los Angeles in Los Angeles County. Oh wow! Oh and, yeah, and ends in the present, and ends you know, and ends on like Skid Row, you know, like it starts out mm -hmm. as social. Critique, yeah. So I'm, I'm I'm imposing this social critique, and of course Anthony Hernandez's work. I mean, there's so many people that you know very well that fit into this, including yourself. And um, you know, wouldn't that be an incredible gift to Los Angeles to oh, make yeah. LA? But but start at Robert Frank. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it could go be it could go back obviously to the. But we've seen Hollywood's heyday and the, those street pictures a million times, and it's bullshit. It's the bullshit <laughs> lies that Hollywood manufactures. It's propaganda. We can pass over all that crap. 
I love it. Yeah. We, I mean, we, maybe, maybe it starts with Max Yavno, really, but but definitely Robert Frank. Mm-hmm. You know. And, no, yeah, we definitely got to talk about that because I would love I would love to help that help that David Strick. You know, and then and then Suzanne Stein. Now her work. Did you see her work in Skid Row? Suzanne no, Stein. I don't think I've seen that. Oh yes, oh. yes, I've seen that. Yes, yeah. I've seen. Of course, I've seen that. Yeah. I mean. She's terrifically talented. Um, anyway, so that's what I want to do in going west. I want to. I want to curate a show. I want it to be at LACMA, or or maybe Hammer, or uh, maybe Jeffrey Deitch's place. I don't know, but it's got to be in a place that's got you know good good insurance policy because twelve Robert Franks are worth. Uh, you know, in the millions, so you know we got it. We got you know, this. Is, this is not a gallery show. All right, you know, this, this requires some real, some real heft behind it. So we got it. We got it. So this is one of the things I would like to you to help. With. Absolutely, I'm I'm on, I'm on board. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is: I ask them to recommend another photographer uh, for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Um, I would say that one photographer would be, uh, he happens to be my very dear friend, but it's not nepotism, is Harvey Wang. Harvey Wang, who has uh, uh, the deepest archive of, uh, of, of anybody I know, um, photographing uh, New York City, and uh, photographing in tandem with uh, David Isay, the um, creator of um, StoryCorps. StoryCorps. Oh, yeah. Story. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, but before David started StoryCorps, he, ha- he created a company called uh, Sound Portraits Productions. Um, and they're all, and, and all of the docs that he, many of the docs that he did, he did in tandem with Harvey. Uh, doing the pictures and they did books together uh, on the flops, ha- flop houses and on the Bowery and such. And, uh, but just all of these oddball characters all over America that David would go to to make a radio piece mm-hmm. uh, for uh, NPR. We did a piece together. The Gods of Times Square was originally a radio piece. After I had started Gods of Times Square, I, um, I was only shooting two years I, 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 uh, Harvey introduced me to David and David heard the tapes and said, we can make a radio piece out of this. And then we did. We made this amazing radio piece that was called The Gods of Times Square. It was on NPR, on All Things Considered. It, it aired on uh, uh, December 23rd, uh, 1994, as America, on a Friday, as America was going home for Christmas weekend. And uh, it was Robert, uh, whatever his name was, uh, introducing it. You know, all things considered, you know, yeah. millions and millions of people heard this thing. It was crazy. And it's very, uh, you know, it's very uh, um, uh, anti-establishment, this, this piece, you know, uh, Gods of Times Square, even more so perhaps in the radio piece than the movie, because it had to really cut to the chase. Yeah. But, well, I'm gonna uh, have to dig that up and see if I can find it. I, it's uh, it's on the universe, uh, the State University of New York Albany. I'll send it to you. It's on their, okay. on their website. But um, anyway, Harvey Wang, Harvey Wang's archive of New York in the '70s and '80s, uh, everything from seltzer delivery men to people that work on Coney Island roller coasters. I mean, Harvey made a book called Harvey Wang's New York. And that was the tip of the iceberg of his documentation of New York. He was just this tireless documenter. And he really documented, you know, the avant-garde music scene in New York in the 70s and the early 80s. Uh, Club 54 on 54 St. Mark's was where, you know, the, the you know Klaus Nomi and you know, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the wildest performance artists, um, you know, when New York was in its, you know, probably highest artistic heyday would be the late, well, early, early 80s. Yeah. Harvey got that. That's, yeah, that's crazy. 
Harvey Wang. Richard, thank you so much, man. It was thank lovely you. to catch up. Uh, great to catch up with you, and uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks to Richard for joining us. Learn more about Richard and his work by visiting richardsandler.com. And if you're a fan of our work, you can write reviews on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts and share a favorite episode on social networks, be it Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or Threads. Remember to use the hashtag TheCandidFrame. You can also support us financially by contributing via PayPal or Patreon. Links are on the website. We've relaunched our newsletter, and if you want to receive updates on everything related to the Candid Frame and book recommendations and announcements on special events and workshops from both us and some of our guests, please sign up by visiting our website. And if you can't find it, every show episode on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candor Frames audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.